Welcome to the Storm Surf Video Surf Forecast for the week starting Sunday, June 11th. Looking at significant wave heights for the South Pacific Ocean, we see an improving pattern, specifically a gale south of New Zealand with 35-foot seas pushing mainly to the east. That gives us some hope. The other system here uh, in the central South Pacific, all fetch is aimed to the south, providing nothing of interest. And this other system here in the far southeast uh, Pacific is all aimed at Patagonia and southern Chile and of no interest to our immediate forecast area. Let's get into the details. We'll start out our tour looking at jet stream level winds. These winds up about 30,000 feet help support the formation of gales, and when those gales do form, help direct their track. We're looking for trough that is a push to the north in the jet stream in the southern hemisphere, and we have a weak trough here south of New Zealand. The thing is, there's no real winds over here on the west side of it, and it's that energy that normally pushes fetch or helps develop fetch pushing to the northeast. Instead, we see all the fetch or all the energy, 120 knot winds, pretty much running across the top or the top of the trough here or the bottom of the trough, really. Uh, and that would generally mean fetch would be aimed off to the east. Anyway, some support for gale development is, is indicated there. Otherwise, we have a ridge here in over the uh, central and east Pacific, pushing down over Antarctic ice into Antarctica, and that certainly does not support gale development. If anything, it supports high-pressure development. So we'll see how things play out. Now, another gale. Notice this. Uh, Monday night is supposed to develop, not a gale, a trough, I'm sorry, uh, with winds to 150 knots developing and pushing more to the north just here uh, uh, right off of New Zealand going into Tuesday. A um, little bit of a cutoff trough, though. Notice there's winds sort of cutting across. The winds from the old, the previous trough still in play. But anyway, that trough pushes north into Tuesday night, and then it fully gets cut off with a ridge developing and pushing down into Antarctica by Wednesday night. And that's pretty much the end of it. You can just see uh, Antarctic ice is somewhere around 65 or so. And all the energy from the southern branch of the jet is pushing south of that. We'll roll this out. Then we see another something almost it looks like a trough supposed to develop on Saturday. But it doesn't really get any northward momentum. And then we'll continue out. So you end up with this split zonal flow. Zonal flow. The southern branch of the jet running more or less straight uh, west to east. The northern branch here running again also west to east. No troughs indicated. High pressure in between the two flows and nothing to support gale development. And that continues out into Monday. But for right now, one trough uh, on the charts. Another one forecast in the next day or so providing some hope for uh, gale development in lower levels of the atmosphere. Let's go take a look down at the surface. Here we are, surface level pressure, surface level winds, and as expected, gale here south of New Zealand. A little patch of 45 knot winds. In fact, let's go back in time just a second. We're going back to Friday evening. This is the first signs of this gale creeping onto the chart south of Tasmania. Here we'll just there we go. Friday evening, 50. It's not a gale. Actually, it's a storm. Notice 55 knot winds pushing from the west. Now, not really in the swell yet window yet, but those winds getting traction on the ocean surface, generating seas. Then we get into Saturday morning, 55. This is Saturday, June 10th, 55 knot winds still from the west. And the great circle paths right here kind of they kind of go pretty much west to east and then start tracking up towards the northeast. So certainly some uh, fetch in the California swell window, not so much for Hawaii. And then the system started fading out Saturday night, winds down to 40 knots, only to rebuild some here on Sunday a.m. at 45 knots. And then continuing forward, the scale is expected to start fading out by Monday morning, 30 knot winds, and that's just not uh, strong enough to create enough period, enough energy to have any sort of a swell reach up into the northern hemisphere. Also looking at some other spurious low pressure systems, also strong high pressure here pushing down to the south on Monday morning. Just really nothing strong enough to generate a whole lot. Now here's this next gale. In fact, let's go back just a little bit. You see it's starting to organize late Sunday night here south of Tasmania, pushing almost directly into the southern tip of New Zealand 
on Monday. And that's not the por- the part that we're so interested in. It's starting here about Monday night, this little sliver of 50 knot winds here. Now that's all aimed north into New Zealand. But by mon- by Tuesday morning, 50 knot winds pushing northeast. That's uh, aimed very well at Tahiti, very well at Hawaii, and very well at the U.S. West Coast. The issue is it's a very small fetch area, and it's pushing hard to the northeast. We've had this discussion before. You want the fetch to push up the Great Circle Paths, and the Great Circle Paths relative to much of the U.S. West Coast is towards the northeast, also for Hawaii and Tahiti. Where's Tahiti? Uh, it's right, where is it? Somewhere right around in this vicinity, okay? And notice that is not very far from this uh, low, which means a lot of energy will hit it uh, and with little decay. Different story for the U.S. West Coast and Hawaii, though. Anyway, the system starts fading Tuesday night, 45 knot winds, and then pretty much dies from there. Now, there's this other system down here south of Tahiti, also forecast on Wednesday, and uh, yet remnants of this low are to regenerate again on uh, Wednesday night, little, in fact, Wednesday afternoon, 40 knot winds. Let's go back there. Even into Wednesday, we'll just roll the whole thing. So here's the main fetch, and there we go. Here's this next little fetch forecast right behind it. Not, again, very small footprint. Most of the energy here pushing south of no interest. And then yet another system on Thursday night develops 50 knot winds now, uh, supposedly pushing northeast again, yet more fetch. So, and yet another one, look at this down below that. Uh, now again, moving east to west. So there's a lot of potential, a lot going on here in the New Zealand area in the next, uh, oh, we'll say over the next five days or so. We'll keep rolling this out. And then things appear to settle down after that and a little bit quieter pattern is projected. Let's go take a look at the wave models. So we're starting back in time, Friday night, the first system pushing under New Zealand was at 36 foot seas. We'll see what that does. Built to 40, almost 41 feet there and up to 44 feet. Now notice the arrows, it's all aimed due east. So uh, the preference is more northeast, but still some small swell should result. Nothing huge, uh, and it's not a huge system either. Still, 44-foot seas into Saturday afternoon, and then it started mellowing out on Sunday. And then we move into the forecast charts here. Next system developing on Monday night uh, uh, in the ta- South Tasman Sea. Most energy pushing into New Zealand. Here's the fetch we're interested in. 38-foot seas developing Tuesday morning up to 41 feet. Very tiny area, though, and 40 feet, 39 feet, tucked right along New Zealand there on Tuesday afternoon into Wednesday, fading out 35-foot seas. Then some secondary fetch, making a tiny little area, 30-foot seas. Probably won't see much from that. Then this second, the secondary low on Thursday night. And this is just new on the charts, or the best it's been so far. We'll see. That's it's still five days off from forming. 36, 37-foot seas aim northeast over a very small area. And another system, we saw that down here to the south, 37-foot seas we will give it, but again off to the east. And yet another system here, uh, we'll see if anything, nothing really comes of that. And then things mellow out from there. So a possible run of... Uh, We'll give it small southwest angled swell, uh, favoring Tahiti for sure. Hawaii should get some energy, and of course the U.S. West Coast. And now just for fun, let's do this first. We'll so great circle paths relative to Hawaii. Here's the path, really, was at the 201 path getting around New Zealand. Now notice the system. This is the uh, the Friday system. We're into actually Friday night, and we'll just roll this out. See, relative to Hawaii, the system's almost falling southeast. Very sideband a- a- angled energy relative to Hawaii from the first one. But now the second system that's forecast here on uh, Tuesday, there's the great circle path. And just fo- watch how this system lifts right up along the pass. And Tahiti is just a little bit off. It's over here. Much the same thing for Tahiti. Um, oh, we, ha- we have a great circle path. For- and then here's that secondary system. Okay. 
Let's do the same thing for Tahiti. Here we go. This one, again, the first system, not so impressive. But the second system, not large, pushing right up the great circle paths. And then that secondary fetch also pushing right up the great circle paths. And you see how close. In fact, um, we could probably do distance. Let's see if we can do this real quick. Here we go. There you go. 2,500 nautical miles, roughly, or less. In fact, we'll roll back here. There we go. This is, again, the, the second system. 1,800 nautical miles, 1,900 nautical miles. Uh, so relatively close indeed versus that same fetch relative to California. We'll just put it somewhere, central California. We're talking 5,500 nautical miles. And then here we go, same thing again, relative to Southern California. Now look at the Great Circle Pass here. They pretty much back here run west to east. And this this system, the first system, not so bad. I mean, not great. It still is kind of falling southeast. Not a whole lot expected from that. But the second system, you can see, tracks right up the Great Circle Pass, plain as can be, unobstructed, not in the the shadowed window. Southern California, a little bit more shadowed. Uh, uh, for the first system, but the second system free and clear. And we'll just roll this out. We'll look at the forecast too so you can see that. And that, that was it. We'll also take a quick look here at the northern hemisphere. There was a little low that developed here in the western Gulf on Friday into Saturday. It got there. That's about where it peaked out. 21 foot seas uh, aimed sort of at central California, more at the Pacific Northwest and British Columbia. And then it faded out. And let's just take a quick, and then there's some, some secondary fetch on Sunday, but we're talking 14-foot seas and well away from anywhere. Not a whole lot expected from that. And then we'll look at the forecast. As expected, that low just sort of, just really doesn't do anything. More sense of something trying to get going, and we're talking June. Oh, here was this other, uh, on uh, Wednesday night, little tiny area fetches forecast off of Cape Mendocino, if you believe it. Uh, 30 knot winds that gets you uh, 14 foot seas. Wind swells supposed to be raking the California coast. Winds, north winds, just not a whole lot great. We'll show you that in a second. Otherwise, the North Pacific is going to sleep for the season. All right, and then let's do the usual inspection of winds for the coming week for both California and Hawaii. A little area 15 knot fetch here associated with high pressure 900 miles north of Hawaii. Uh, not really generating any wind swell. Also, this high starting to ridge into the California coast. This is what's generating brisk uh, north winds along the coast, 15, 20 knots. And you see by Sunday night, it's only worse. Uh, the fetch relative to Hawaii as we get into Monday starts falling south a little bit more, but it's only 15 knot winds. Probably not a whole lot going to happen from that. And the same kind of a windy mess relative to California. You get into Tuesday, fetch still, I mean, for central California, you want the fetch more up here, not impacting the coast as much. This looks pretty good for Hawaii. By pretty good, we're talking, you know, maybe some sort of three foot wind swell or something like that. Um, Fetch continues. The high starts ridging into the coast. Here's this low we were talking about on Wednesday night. 30 knot winds, but they're kind of southwest winds, really favoring more up in this area. And there was, I think, 15 foot seas forecast from that. And that fades out. High pressure continues, but starts fading relative to why. Wind swells gone by probably Thursday night. Um, and again, just a lot of upwelling. So the water temperatures were reasonably warm over the weekend in Northern California. That will probably go back to being rather cool if all this wind develops as forecast. Then as we get into the weekend, a little bit better pattern. The gradient moves north, 30 knot winds off of eh, maybe Point Arena, something like that. But it's more Sunday. There you go. Then you have your 30 knot winds further to the north. Winds starting to lighten up along the central coast. Better odds for wind, you know, a cleaner sort of wind swell pattern. And that continues into almost Monday. Almost looks like some fetch again is going to try to redevelop relative to Hawaii then too. Wind swell for east facing shores possible. All right, let's move on. Taking a look long term, what's going on with the MJO, Madden Julian oscillation, and of course El Nino, the southern oscillation, and, and see if that will contribute at all to storm development for the long-term outlook. 
As usual, we'll start looking at winds over the equator, specifically the Kelvin wave generation area. This is the far west Pacific. That's New Guinea there. This is the far east Pacific. Uh, the Galapagos Islands are somewhere right around there. It's on the equator that we're looking, and specifically from 170 west off to about 135 east, 5 degrees north and south of the equator. We're looking for a slackening of trades in this area, and we actually see some hints of that. Notice how strong the east winds are blowing in, in the east Pacific, not as strong over here. Uh, slackening of trades help promote um, warm water moving from the west to the east, and the more warm water you get over in the east Pacific, that's a sure sign of El Nino. We're not saying that's happening anytime soon. We look at anomalies, differences from normal for this time of year. And sure enough, we see just a slight uh, dead neutral winds. No, actually a little bit less than neutral, giving us some westerly anomalies. Over here in the far east Pacific, though, notice how strong the east trades are. And also we're getting uh, easterly anomalies. So that causes upwelling off of the Galapagos, Ecuador, and down into to Peru. Looking at wind anomalies for the past, was it five days or so? Here's the Kelvin wave. Oh, so here's South America, Mexico, Australia, New Guinea right there. Kelvin wave generation area on the equator right in this little box here. Blues suggest easterly anomalies, oranges, yellows, uh, reds, westerly anomalies. So kind of a mixed bag here in the Kelvin wave generation area. And you just sort of run your eye down here and look. And here, here's, what, June 9th, two days ago. And you see westerly anomalies getting a little bit of a foothold in this area. Nothing too strong, just slightly westerly of normal. And then the forecast, Kelvin wave generation area, basically just just the side of these two tick marks right there. This is the whole planet wrapped on one chart. Purples and blues are, are easterly anomalies, and you can see all through May, strong easterly anomalies indicative of the inactive phase of the MJO. That's not very supportive of gale development at all. Things starting to back off a little bit here the first week of June. For the next week in June, and this is just a one-week forecast, you get the sense that maybe easterly anomalies trying to develop a little bit, but then fading out. Still no strong westerly anomalies at all, just kind of a neutral mixed pattern, but I'd say biased towards uh, easterly anomalies indicative of some flavor of La Nina. Here we go, the outgoing long wave radiation charts, a good way to forecast El Nino, two week forecast. Yellows suggest higher sunlight reflectivity than normal, meaning high pressure, meaning the inactive phase of the MJO. This per the statistic model, it basically says we're gonna go into a dead neutral MJO pattern. Now this is really interesting. The dynamic model suggests the kind of the opposite of that, a building La Nina pattern, um, not La, La Nina, the inactive phase of the MJO, with the active phase bottled up somewhere in the far uh, west Indian Ocean. This would not be conducive to gale development. If anything, this would support the split jet stream flow, just like what we saw in the charts down here in the southern hemisphere, and would probably not support storm development. Phase diagram charts, another way for monitoring the active phase of the MJO. So you're looking down on the North Pole, the MJO moves uh, on the equator from the Indian Ocean over the maritime continent, say Bali, across the West Pacific, under the U.S., uh, on the equator, across the Atlantic on the equator, above Africa, and back to the Indian Ocean. Its current position is where the heavy dot is, basically you know, somewhere around uh, West Africa maybe, uh, something like that. And the forecast, just this, and if it's inside the circle, it's considered to be extremely weak. So basically, no active phase forecast per this, the ECMF model. The GEFS model suggests, yeah, the active phase is supposed to build a little bit, but be in the far western Indian Ocean two weeks out and not particularly strong. So none of this bodes well for swell development in the Pacific Ocean. Probably does a little bit better for the Indian Ocean. And that's kind of typical of La Nina. The upper level chart used to track uh, potential for precipitation, but you can also use it as a proxy for the MJO. Uh, yellows and oranges suggest drier than normal air, suggest uh, the inactive phase of the MJO, and that sort of syncs up. This runs about two weeks ahead of what's actually going on down at the surface. So this suggests, if you look at kind of a wave moving across 
the inactive phase of the MJO moving from the West Pacific into the East Pacific uh, through the 1st of July, then kind of a dead pattern or, if anything, maybe a sort of a resurgence of the inactive, uh, the dry phase of the MJO. And then finally, June 6th, the, the active phase of the MJO is supposed to materialize and then work its way across the Pacific and reasonably strong. And then the trusty CFS model, 850 millibar wind anomalies, again, up about 4,000 feet. Uh, this is the current time looking back in history here. You see we've been through a bit of a east anomaly. Oh, and the Kelvin wave generation area is right in between here. You see we've been through a bit of a bit of east anomalies forecast or the current position basically kind of neutral. Let's overlay the MJO just to see. And there's the inactive phase of the MJO fading out. Here's a, some very weak active phase trying to make some headway, getting nowhere still, and then trying to resurge just a little bit. This is all part of one wave right here. And you can see a little bit of westerly anomalies forecast in the Kelvin wave generation area in say the last two weeks of June. And this has been on the chart for quite a while now. Kind of fades a little bit as some dry uh, spell tries to organize. But then here's this big active phase of the MJO forecast for moving into the Calvin wave generation area. We'll say about mid-July and then continuing solid all the way through August. This would be the time for storm development in the southern hemisphere if it's going to happen but who knows? Now, the low-pass filter, this is what we use for monitoring La Nina. According to this, we have about three more days, four more days of La Nina. The, the dotted contour here is La Nina. You really want, and also this solid contour, which is over the Indian Ocean. If you want to see La Nina, the solid contour needs to move into the Kelvin wave generation area. That's not supposed to happen. In fact, if you look out as we get into the early part of fall, it suggests the solid contour redevelops, dotted contour redevelops. Now, it was all hanging over here, which would be basically over California. Now, it's supposed to redevelop here, even out in the uh, the eastern Kelvin wave generation area. So hard to say, but it sort of looks like a return of some very weak La Nina pattern come the fall. In fact, just what's going on over uh, the Kelvin wave generation right now, this sort of persistent easterly anomaly thing suggests that some weak La Nina pattern still is in control. It has not given up the ghost. And even when it supposedly dies per this, there's still some bias in the atmosphere for it. Not unexpected, to be perfectly honest. We had two years of a pretty good La, uh, El Nino going. Was that 2014, 2015, 2016? into 2017 was our La Nina rebound. It wasn't very strong at all, and it would not be surprising to see another year of La Nina. Very weak, but to see it just the same. Next, we see what's going on in the ocean. That gives us some clues of what the long-term outlook is going to be like as well. West Pacific here, East Pacific here, the equator. This is uh, two degrees north and south looking at water temperatures down in the ocean, the water profile. These are the TAO buoy array anchor lines. The X's are sensors. These are actual temperatures, the short of it. Warm water balled up in the West Pacific, but making some progress to the east. Not horrible. There's a, it's certainly not La Nina, but certainly not El Nino either. These actual temperatures, but let's go take a look at the anomalies. You see, actually, we have three degree anomalies in the East Pacific. That from one tiny little Kelvin wave, it wasn't even good enough to call a Kelvin wave, couple months ago, and now another Kelvin wave, a little bit stronger, trying to make its way off to the east. The issue here is there's not a whole lot of warm water. We only see one degree anomalies here in the West Pacific. There's just not enough warmer to, warm water to feed some sort of a developing El Nino pattern. You'd need to see a lot of warm water over here to, uh, you know, to set you up for an El Nino in the fall. That's not happening. This cool pocket down pretty far down, oh, is that, oh, below 100 meters, we're not giving it any credence at, or meaning of any meaning at this point in time. This is probably the best indicator. We can't imagine these warm anomalies are going to continue because there's nothing over here to yet get another Kelvin wave going. That is a ball of warm water that during the active phase of the MJO, you get west anomalies here. That would take some of this warm water, push it to depth, 
and then make it push the whole way across the uh, equatorial Pacific. We don't see that happening. Uh, this other uh, uh, view uh, using the same data, it models it a little bit differently, suggests, yes, there is maybe a little bit warmer than what we saw in the other chart, maybe one one and a half degree anomalies over here. That's still not much. And there's some sense that there's a Kelvin wave right there in flight working its way off to the east. But again, just not a big reservoir of warm water. Upper ocean heat anomalies, June, la July last year, La Nina, cold water. Here's the West Pacific. Here's the East Pacific. La Nina fully in control. And then it just abruptly died come about December. And here was that first little Kelvin wave. We Hard to believe it was even a Kelvin wave in March. Just sort of warm water drifting off this way. Trades died off of uh, uh, the South America. Uh, upwelling ceased. Ocean temperatures warmed up. You see that right here was at one, two, three, one, two, three, one to one and a half degree anomalies in this area. And then here's this next Kelvin wave in flight. We're talking about a half to one degree anomalies that's not much of a kelvin wave also notice a little bit of cooler temperatures developing here in the kelvin wave generation area just the past couple of days um and so anyway the thought being maybe this is the upwelling phase of the kelvin wave cycle kelvin wave upwelling phase downwelling phase upwelling phase but still notice there was warmer water here that's all gone now if anything cooler water is starting to show up so there just isn't any support for an El Nino to develop of, of at all. I won't even say of any magnitude, just say there's probably no chance of it happening. And yet, more data. This is sea level anomalies. Stri uh, Jason 2 satellites strip out all the waves, strip out the tides, strip out wind swell. If you see a bump on the surface that is positive anomalies in on the equator, that suggests warm water at depth. Warm water, of course, expands and creates, would therefore create a little bump on the ocean surface. Here is our Kelvin wave, zero to five centimeter anomalies, not a whole lot, nothing to, you know, just a very weak Kelvin wave. A little bit of warmth here off of uh, Chile, Peru, well, mainly Peru, and, the, and uh, uh, Ecuador, the Galapagos there, suggesting warm water, but not a whole lot. The Kelvin wave generation area where you'd want to see all of your warm water balled up. Actually, it's from here out to about here. We don't see hardly anything, suggesting not much warm water at depth, suggesting no fuel for Kelvin wave development. Taking a look at the surface, though, things actually look better than, uh, you know, than what we'd, we'd been depicting. Warm water in general over the uh, Nina 1.2 region. Now, building here off of North Chile, South Peru, and also off of Peru, um, it had actually, warm water had developed more, and it's starting to get uh, cut out a little bit. We suspect there's some uh, building of trades along here, upwelling, trying to get going again. Um, you see this little pocket here. That was from previous upwelling that worked its way up here, it's starting to move off. Uh, generally, though, warmer than average water over the entire region, but nothing markedly so. We're not particularly inspired though as of June 10th. Here's the trend for the past seven days and you see cooler, the trend is cooler waters here along Peru, off of Ecuador, the Galapagos right there, and working its way this way. So you get the sense there's upwelling going on, getting picked up by enhanced trades, pushed off here. Eventually, that'll work its way into the Nina 3.4 region, that area from 120 west to 170 west. That's the official El Nino monitoring region. And right now, man, eh, we're not seeing anything that says any kind of an El Nino. If anything, we're seeing sort of a tendency towards maybe weak La Nina. And then you look at actual anomalies across the entire Pacific basin, sort of backed off. And these notice these cooler pockets here. These weren't here at all a week ago. They're starting to develop. Now, we're not saying that's bad. You know, it's a mixture of this sort of warmer, cooler thing, basically saying neutral, normal water temperatures here. And whatever happens here eventually gets picked up by the trades and pushed off here into the official El Nino monitoring region, 120 west to 170. Right now, it, this area looks generally warmer than normal, a little bit, maybe half a degree. That's just sort of eyeballing it. But notice there's warmer 
than normal water over all the oceans, the tropics and the Atlantic with a, La Ni a weak La Nina play. That means shear is less over here and lots of warm water. One would think that the hurricane season might be a bit higher than usual relative to Florida, U.S. East Coast. And the official forecasts are suggesting that, too. None of this bodes well, though, for the uh, Pacific tropical season in the East Pacific. Maybe better, though, in the far West Pacific. In this region, in the fall months, sometimes you get some good storms spin up. They get caught by the jet. They traverse over into the Gulf of uh, Alaska and help create early season and late season storms and swell, but way too early to start speculating about that yet. But generally, a warmer pattern in play, neutral though, in the uh, El Nino Genesis region. And here you go, uh, water temperatures in the Nino 1.2 region, this region, Galapagos, uh, Peru, Ecuador area. You can see we had a bit of warming here in late April into early May. Not even about one degree at most above normal. And then we had this big upwelling event later in May in that region. And now temperatures are rebounding. They're about dead neutral, 0 0.021 below normal. So dead neutral. This data is very noisy, though, in the Nino 1.2 region. In the Nino 3.4 region, official El Nino monitored region temperatures today, half a degree, 0.517 above normal. And that's about what we saw in the other charts. And they were, they've been up to 0.8 at one point and then down into 0.2 or 0.3 degrees. So about a half degree above normal. Um, El Nino would be multiple months, about nine months of half a degree or warmer. Uh, we're probably not seeing that and probably won't see that given all the other data that we've seen. Next, we look to see what's going on in the atmosphere. How is the atmosphere responding to ocean temperatures and ocean circulation? One measure of that is the Southern Oscillation Index, difference in pressure between Darwin, Australia, and Tahiti. Negative numbers for a long enough period of time suggest the active phase of the MJO. And look at this. We have about 11 days of negative numbers, current value minus 19.26. That's pretty good. This actually suggests, and we've seen nothing of this, looking at any of the other data, that some sort of active phase of the MJO is setting up. The 30-day running average, and here's another way to look at it, the running average is probably, the 30-day average is a better way for looking for the active phase of the MJO. These numbers are kind of noisy. And the current value is 1.15. We want to see this around negative 5, at least, if there's some sort of active phase going on. So that doesn't appear to be the case. 90-day running average, way to monitor El Nino or La Nina. Current value, minus 2.30. Uh, if you got some sort of an El Nino, this would be down, it needs to be down around minus 15. So it's basically, this is neutral, this is neutral, this is negative for the moment, but we'll see. So kind of just a dead neutral pattern occurring as of now. And here's the graph of the 30-day moving southern oscillation index. Of course, back in 2015, El Nino, you can see our 30-day our average was down minus 20, almost down to minus 25. Then our, our first pulse of La Nina, uh, July 2016, you can see we we're up at plus 15 almost. But now we've been falling down as we get towards summer here. Current value, just about zero. What was it two, I think, plus two. Okay, the question is, what's going to happen? Are we going to continue down into El Nino, go back to La Nina, or just sit neutral? Who knows? Uh, no clear signs, though, that we're moving into an El Nino because they're just the, the water temperatures of the ocean don't support it. Then there's the ESPI index. Uh, instead of measuring difference between pressure but north of Darwin and uh, north of Tahiti. This is actual uh, precipitation. Uh, that is, if you have a negative index, you have less than normal precipitation in this area. Notice this coincides very nicely with the Nino uh, 3.4 region from 120 west to right, right around 170 west. Current value, minus 1.46. So, the, at the peak of La Nina this year, we we're down at minus 1.9, so we're still there. We had actually hoped we were rebounding, but still dry air in here, suggesting some sort of La Nina is going on. And it's we were at oh minus 0.4 or something like that a couple of weeks ago, and now we've rebounded back to minus 1.46. 
meaning and this this tends to lead what happens in the ocean by about two to three months uh, at least in terms of when El Nino is going or strong La Nina. The thought is this is probably sensing that there's going to be something going on, cool up welling perhaps, and working its way into the Nino 3.4 region, suggesting at least neutral temperatures, certainly not El Nino. So for the immediate future, uh, one small southwest swell under New Zealand trying to work its way towards Hawaii, Tahiti, U.S. West Coast. A better system on the charts, at least in terms of its direction of travel, not as big, not as high as seas, but aimed much better. Certainly some swell for Tahiti, Hawaii, and the U.S. West Coast seems possible with tidbits of other stuff lingering past that, and then things settle down again. Wind swell, not so much for Hawaii for the coming weeks, certainly for California, upwell in cooler temperatures. Beyond that, long term, uh, no clear signs of the active phase of the MJO, meaning no clear signs of support for significant storm development in the southern hemi, at least until we get into maybe late in June, early July time frame. There's been that uh, thing on the CFS model for quite a while now, West Anomalies, and uh, the active phase of the MJO. So we'll see what happens. So it's get wind swell this week. Hope for Southern Hemi swell. It won't be big when it comes, but at least there'll be something. And then we'll keep our eye on the charts and hope for the active phase of the MGO later in July. So that's it for this week. We'll do it again next week. Same time, same channel. Thanks for watching.